then I'm saved. And so when I say after a while it felt like the Holy Spirit was rolling his eyes at me, that's exactly what it felt like. The things I had been reading was like, <laughs> you know, what, what are you thinking right now? And, I, and I've dealt with people that have told me the same kind of dilemma that they're going through, and I'll just ask them. You know, you ask the Lord to save you, and yes, and, and a little bit later, you ask him again, yes, and a little bit later, you doubt, and you start asking him again. Don't you think he heard you once? <laughs> Don't you think it was one of those times he actually did what he was going to, what he said he was going to do? <laughs> Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Now, if somebody doesn't believe that, how's that a good thing? Yeah. Yeah. God said he'd, he'd respond when you called on him. God said, you call on me and I'll save you. Amen. And then here's somebody that calls on him and they're taught to, hey, you know what they say, if you don't doubt your salvation, you don't have anything to doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, that's just absolutely nuts. You know, I, I know I'm saved because I doubt it. <laughs> the fact that I doubt my salvation must mean I really got it. You know, the Bible says, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. You know what? If you're saved based on your assurance of the Word of God and what it says, you, you've got a Bible reason that you know that you're saved and you still doubt it. Folks, that's a lack of faith. You're, you're failing to believe the Word of God. i got no business up here tell, advocating doubt and telling you, well, you should doubt. <laughs> you no, know, you shouldn't. Amen. You ought to build on the rock that never rolls. Amen. You ought to build on this, not shifting sand. Build on the foundation of the Word of God. Now, how can you know that you've passed from death into life? Well, Jesus is the one that talks about being born again. And, of course, as He spoke to... Uh, Nicodemus that day, he wasn't talking about anything physical. Nicodemus thought he was. Nicodemus was all confused. He didn't understand what he was talking about there. Peter later on, the Spirit of God shows us more information there, showing that we're born again of incorruptible seed by the words of God, the living, abiding, enduring word of God. And of course, Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life, and the Spirit of God is in these words, and so... Through faith in these words, the individual is born of the Spirit. And a miraculous happening where we go from being an Adam, dead in our sins, children of wrath, suddenly we're in Christ. And we're removed from being under the wrath of God. And we experience the love of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and again, that's a work of God. That's accomplished by the power of God. That's accomplished by the Spirit of God. It's something that is simply not visible. As great as that transaction is, somebody coming from a child of wrath to a child of God, somebody being under the condemnation of God to being in the love of God in Christ Jesus, uh, somebody who was going to hell now going to heaven, their name's in the book of life, the Spirit of God's in them. That transaction is such a miraculous transaction. You think that right before it happens, you know, this fog rolls in <laughs> and the ground rumbles and the, the windows start to rattle. <laughs> But none of that happens, friend. <laughs> none of that takes place. You know what it is? It's just a matter of the Spirit of God. And it's not visible. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 5 says, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. You know what he said? He said there's a lot of things that God does that's just out of your sight. You know what you've got to do? You've got to trust Him you got to trust Him that He means what He says, and He says what He means. Now, with some folks, when they come to be saved, there might be a physical trembling. I've explained it before, is that, you know, it's a matter of faith. Feelings accompany faith. And you've got some people that when they come to the Lord, they've got an understanding of how lost they are. And they've got faith to understand. They're, they are really headed for hell. They've got great faith about that. And they understand the mercy of God and the grace of God. So it, for them, it might really be a real emotional time for them. You know what else? You can have somebody physically trembling and they don't get saved. You got that with Felix. He trembled, but he didn't get saved. He's looking for a more convenient time that, as far as we know, never came. But regardless of what's happening physically, when a sinner does turn to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing the Word of God there... Uh, when that happens there, by the Spirit of God, that person's changed. And you might not notice the thing happening. Sometimes there may be an expression 
there may be a change in their countenance. I'll say this, I like it when there is. Yeah, amen. I like, the, I, I like it when there's some emotion. I do like that. I like it when I can see, hey, this person's serious. I like that. But I don't have any, any right when those things aren't there to say, well, now I don't know if they got it. That's what you call a wet blanket. Amen. <laughs> now, I, you know, somebody's serious. You know, we, 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 of course, we assume the Spirit of God's going to do His job, and we preach that, we teach that. He's going to do His job. He's going to reprove men of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. But we do emphasize at the same time the sincerity of the sinner. You know, if, if, if I'm sitting there goading somebody, goading somebody, and they go through something just to shut me up, yeah, that's not salvation. That's not salvation. You know, them, them guys, they'll just push you, push you, push you, and you've got to be saying, no, no, no. It's up to you. It's up to you. I don't have to walk out there and say, i got 14 people saved. I don't have to do that. <laughs> Amen. There's no pressure on me to do that whatsoever. Amen. You know what I want to do? I want to tell them the truth. I want, it to be, I want it to be understood by the time I'm through what it was I was saying, and then I want them to make the choice. And it's up to them to make the choice there. And there have been times when I have led somebody to Christ and there was great emotion shown. And there have been times when I led somebody to Christ and I couldn't detect anything was going on at all. You say, well, how do you know they're serious? I don't. You know what else? I don't have to. And I don't have to walk off and tell you about whether or not I think they did it or not. You understand? That's, the, the Lord's never going to say, well, now just about how many folks do you think you actually led to Christ? At the judgment seat, that's not coming up. You know what's going to come up is how faithful I was to preach the gospel. Was, was I fishing for men? Now they're accountable as whether or not they were sincere or not. And you know what I've seen? I've seen people that got emotional and they fizzed out. <laughs> and I've seen others that just stone cold look at you and you didn't know whether or not they were serious or not. And they got in and they never looked back. And so you just can't tell. And that's the point. It's not visible. It's not a physical thing there. Now, I've got preacher brethren, good Bible-believing men there. that they, they preach the truth on, you know, many things there. But they would break with me on this. And, you know, as far as that matter goes, that's where we'd have to disagree. But, but not, like I've said before, that's not, a mere, that's not a matter of mere personal judgment. All right? It's a, it's a biblical presentation that when somebody is saved, you, you might be able to tell something and you might not. You don't know what's going on there. Now, I've had you turn to John chapter 5, and Jesus explaining this. Look at verse 23. John 5, 23. He says, That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. And I'll just inject this right now. That means Islam is out. <laughs> well, as long as they believe in God. No, no. You can't honor God without honoring Jesus Christ. And so just saying, you know, well, we pray in God's name, that's not it. You could be praying to the devil. You understand? You know what gets you through to God? His Son. He's the mediator. Your standing is in His Son or you don't have any standing. And He says that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent Him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. Now that, folks, is a blessing. Amen. You hang your hat on that. That's the Lord talking. And he said, you know what you got to do? You got to believe. <laughs> you got to hear the word and you got to believe the word. You know what his instruction is? If that's what's happened, he says, let me let you in on something. You got it. <laughs> Amen. Is that my spin or is that what he said? Now isn't it good the Lord would say, I'm going to tell you something. You have everlasting life. If you heard the word of God and you believed on him that sent me, you've got everlasting life. He said, and you shall not come into condemnation, but you're passed from death unto life. Look over there at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, I'm saying, at this point, we have to be told that. Amen. <laughs> you have to be told that. Because you don't know. You take God at His Word. You believe it by faith. The ground didn't shake. An angel didn't appear. Light didn't break down from heaven. Amen. Amen. 
You might have got emotional. You might have got you touched, whatever, you know, you got excited about it. That's good. But that's not the evidences of what we're talking about. That accompanies faith. You know what? Sometimes a child has a little faith. They have a little understanding. But it doesn't hinder them. You know what? Sometimes a, a, a man, uh, his, his understanding is shallow. But he knows he's in trouble. And he's ready, he's ready to turn to God. And uh, one thing that will not happen ever is somebody go to the Lord right now. I'm talking about right now. Somebody go to the Lord to be saved. And the Lord say, no, it's not time for you. Yeah, someone says, well, they can't seek the Lord. And you read Proverbs chapter 1. And you see a group right there that uh, they won't seek Him. And He said, all right, when your calamity comes, I'm going to laugh at you. When your judgment falls on you, I'm going to laugh at you. And then you know what He says? He says, then you're going to seek Me. Yeah. Amen, brother. Now the Calvinists will take that point and they'll say, well, see there, there's a time when you've got to come. Well, you know, the context of that time in Proverbs is a nation that's full around with idols. And their window for repenting is narrowing down. And sure enough, it came and went. You know what they did? They started seeking God. You know what the Lord did? He let them go. I mean, His judgment against Judah was terrible. It was awful. We just went through Ezekiel and we saw that. We saw how terrible it was when they just let the window of opportunity close on them. But He's not talking about a sinner in salvation. It's not as if, you know, there's this time on the clock and you've got to hit it just right. And the Lord's going to say, okay, now look, it, now's the time. You've got to move now. You've got to move now. And then after that, forget it. You never have another opportunity to be saved because you missed your window of opportunity. Now all that, folks, is not biblical. That, that, hey, listen, the Lord has said, come. He has said, come. And you're responsible to come. And you're not going to come and the Lord say, no, nope, you had your chance. <laughs> you know what the window of opportunity is? It's right now while your heart's beating. It's right now before the Lord comes. You better move while you can because once we're gone, this thing takes a whole different twist. The whole thing changes. Now here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said this, or Paul, Paul speaking, says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, some would talk about the eradication of the old nature here. and Talk about the old sins and the old man is done away with. And I really wish that were true. I, I really wish that the old man was gone upon salvation and that I wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. But I've been saved a little longer than two days. <laughs> and I dealt with the old man. I dealt with him this morning. Amen. And uh, he's not going anywhere till the rapture. He'll be changed one day, but uh, again, what he's talking about here, he's talking about this matter of, of, a, of a new life with God. Uh, look at verse 16. Verse 16, up from that, he says, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. Now, there were people there around that time that might have heard Jesus preach. They might have seen Him do some miracles. They might have seen Him there in the flesh, work some of His works and wonders there while He was on earth, but things have changed now. Now He's been lifted up. He's high. He's exalted. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And uh, things have changed in what they would have known about Christ visibly and physically. And, uh, and again, it's not necessarily visible. You know, there was a time when they could touch Him and handle Him and eat with Him and listen to Him and see Him. And watch him calm storms and walk on the water and all those things involved. Now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And it's a matter of faith. And they've got to believe what the record says about him. Elsewise, their heart isn't conditioned to come to God anyway. That's the way the Lord's fixed this. In other words, if a man's honest and he'll come in sincerity and truth, then he'll respond to the light he's given by creation. And he'll respond to the word he's given through preaching or witnessing. And the gospel which declares the truth, he'll respond to it. But if he's haughty and lifted up and he thinks, you know, well, I need to put God in the microscope and figure this thing out for myself, he's not going to make it anyway. And that's just the hard truth. God's not going to jump through hoops. You say, well, he wants people to be saved. Yeah, but they got to come on his terms. And that's in sincerity and in truth. And if they won't have the truth, guess what? They don't get to come. 
Because you can only come by the truth. And that's the importance of faith. Because faith is a believing response to the truth. It's a believing response to the Word of God. Now, once we're saved, the spirit is regenerated. And the soul is redeemed. It's delivered. The body is in layaway. And right now we're subject to the Spirit of God which has changed us. We're new creatures in Christ. We've passed from death into life. We have everlasting life because of the Spirit of God that's been given to us. And He is the power that's going to manifest us as the sons of God one day. Uh, we're looking forward to that. But, but you can't tell that by looking at me. Right? <laughs> you don't know that about me by my flesh. And I don't know that about you by your flesh. Things have changed though. You understand the point I'm making? There were people that knew G Jesus when He was here on earth. And He said, but you don't know Him after the flesh anymore. Things have changed. And now once a person's saved, guess what? They're a new creature too. And things have changed. Things have developed. They went a whole different direction. Now Paul here, uh, he speaks a lot about his own ministry here. About being pressured and not distressed and... Uh, per persecuted, but he's not disowned. He's perplexed, but he's not desperate. Uh, he's prostrate, but he's not defeated. And he says a lot of things there about the ministry here, and, and I won't take the time to go into them, because you get on these things and you get <clears throat> in a rut. <laughs> because it's it's so prevalent. And uh, But how do you have assurance? How do you have absolute assurance? Well, look at First John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, and obviously uh, you expect us to say, you know, the Word of God, but just without worrying about us saying what we're going to say, <laughs> what we're supposed to say, pay attention to what the Word of God says here. Uh, 1 John 5, 10. 1 John 5, 10. Now this evidence of the Scriptures is infallible evidence. And God cannot lie. And he says in verse 10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, folks, uh, uh, showing that to somebody after they've made a profession is a wise thing. That's a wise matter. <laughs> you, you know what I do is I'll, I'll take them some passages there that I've used to show them their need to be saved and how to be saved, and then afterwards I'll say, now you tell me, according to that verse right there, according to that verse... <laughs> Don't tell me what you think I want to hear. According to that verse, you read that verse. Are you saved? <laughs> and, you know, I've seen it where they look down and you can just see it dawning on them. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, according to the Bible, <laughs> I'm saved. Well, that's really where you want to base your assurance. Right there. Because there are going to be times when you're going to struggle with sin just like every man. You're going to have a problem with yourself. And the devil's going to use temptation with you. He ain't going to quit being the devil just because you got saved. Uh, and the world's always the world. And it's always advertising. And it appeals to things of us naturally. And so there's a process to walking with Jesus. And John deals with this. And he says, I want to tell you right up front, you can't say you're walking with God while you're walking in darkness. Because that's not God. He's not going to walk with you in darkness. He said, well, what's that? Is that just somebody's not saved? No, he's talking about... His dear brethren, he's talking about his beloved children there, and he's having to remind them that you're not walking with God if you're walking in darkness. And he says, if we say, who's we? Well, John's a part of them, whoever they are. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So are we to believe that Christians have a problem with sin after they've been saved? According to John, if you said anything otherwise, you'd be lying. You'd be going against what the Scripture says. That's what he says. So he says to us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Thank God for that. You know what that is? That's instruction and fellowship. 
Because whereas my relationship is secure in Jesus Christ, my fellowship is conditional. And if I walk in darkness, I'm no longer walking with God. If I'm siding with the world, I'm siding against God. And still saved to the glory of God's grace. And so what happens when somebody has been walking after the flesh and living for the world is they grieve the Holy Spirit and their own conscience convicts them and they wonder, I wonder if I really got it. <laughs> you know what John said? John says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on His name, that believe on the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. My assurance is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And I don't have any doubts. You know, I was a teenager. I told you a little while ago, I was a teenager. When that fellow said, ah, there's more to it than that. And I went through that whole string of, you know, Lord, if I'm not saved. And then finally, it's just like I got convicted for it. And I just hung my hat on the Word. And said, all right, the Bible told me how to be saved. The Bible is how I got saved. That's where I got my information. I knew I needed to be saved because of the Bible. It told me how to be saved. And so I'm just going to trust the Bible. Amen. And folks, I made my mind up as a young teenager. That's the way it's going to be. And so help me as I stand before you right now. No preacher talk. I'm telling the truth. <laughs> I have had no doubts about salvation since. You say, how, how can you know? It's based on the Scripture. If the Bible says you're saved, what does it matter who says otherwise? And the Word of God has been given to us so that we can know. So that we can know. The Spirit of God is in us, bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And that's a fact. And when we do wrong, you know what happens? We get chastened. And if you're somebody that you can just get away with doing wrong and just keep getting away with it and you never get chastened, then okay. you probably got a biblical reason right there as to why you ought to do some research. But let me say this in closing because it's time. Uh, if you don't know, if you don't know, there's nothing wrong with making sure. All right? Not being, I'm not being anti-scriptural here. If you don't know, there's nothing wrong with making sure. When I talk about people having two and three and four salvation experiences and all that stuff, I'm talking about the effects of that teaching and preaching. But on the other side of that coin, people struggle. And let's face it, you want to get this right. <laughs> you don't want to mess it up. You don't want to get it mixed up. You want to be right on this. And so if you don't know... Make sure. Now, again, you say, well, I've got to make sure it's the right time. No, that's something somebody told you. They're not a bad time. You're not going to catch the Lord doing something else. And he's like, I, I wasn't planning on saving you today. That's not going to happen. <laughs> All right? If you've never been saved, get saved. If you have been, you're not sure, you're, you're battling doubts, make sure. But take those doubts from there once and for all and put them behind you. And build your assurance on the Word of God. Nobody wept on my shoulder and shouted in my ear and squeezed me so tight I thought my eyes were bulging out when I got saved. That might be what happened to you. Might have had a real shindig of a service. I don't know. That's not what happened to me. And I'm not saying what happened to you ain't real. That's, that's exactly what I'm not saying. It's where we take our experiences and we make them doctrine for everybody else. You know, when the Spirit of God got to deal with me, honey, I knew I had to be saved. I couldn't have left that church and... You know, all that kind of stuff there. I didn't give people that just was six years old and bowed their head and believed on Jesus Christ. I didn't give them any assurance at all. <laughs> that goes against that. And the fact is, it ain't how you felt when you got saved. It's what did you trust in when you realized you needed to be saved? If you trusted Jesus Christ and His shed blood, then according to the Bible, <laughs> you're saved. <laughs> And you're as saved as you're ever going to be. <laughs> and you need to you need to get over the doubts and learn how to walk with God and get concerned about other people getting saved. All right, we'll stop right there. Father, thank you, Lord, for the simplicity of salvation, for the truth of the Word of God. And we pray, Lord, that you'll bless the remainder of our meeting together this morning. Bless the preaching. Lord, help us to rally to the truth, Lord, and be strengthened by the truth and not uh, discouraged by the traditions of men. Lord, I just pray that you will cause your word to have free course among us and may it bear fruit in our lives. Uh, God bless the song service. Lord, help us to sing with sincerity in our hearts. Know what we're singing about. Know that we do have a great reason to sing. 
And Father, I pray that you'll help us to encourage one another. We're together. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take a few minutes here to fellowship.